And now for something completely machinima. Tracy Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice, this is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine, use the machinima, Luke. Welcome, my name is Ricky Grove and you're watching and now for something completely machinima podcast, a podcast devoted to machinima and real-time related technologies. I'm here with my pals Tracy Harwood, Damien, and Phil. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. We're in our July series of podcasts. Last week we had Phil's excellent pick, which engendered quite a, a fascinating discussion. This week I think it'll be interesting to see how that discussion leads over into my pick, uh, which is a film by Andy Hughes, uh, who is a filmmaker who lives in Cornwall, UK. The film is called Inner Migration 720. It is a artistic film. I'd like to say experimental because of some of the visual techniques in it. The main game that it's shot in is Cyberpunk uh, 2177, but it also includes uh, fragments of... Uh, audio uh, and sound and narration and video from two what you would call educational films here in the United States, films that are made to show at high schools or at um, meetings. They're sort of non-fictional films meant to educate people. The uh, Prelinger Archives at archive.org is a great place to go for these because they've this fellow uh, Prelinger uh, got maybe 6,000 of them together and they cover everything from war instructions on how to avoid syphilis to uh, kids, young kids learning how to throw a party for the first time or the story of how bread is made in a bakery, all sorts of interesting things. The two films that this Andy Hughes used was Out of This World from 1964, it's a nonfiction film that speculates about what the future will look like in terms of how cities are designed, their architecture, the, the way roads are used. And then another one that came earlier called The New United States from 1940, which talks about the, again, it's more futuristic looking, talking about how what the United States will look like in the future in terms of its politics and its it's uh, the, how the people and culture will change. The uh, filmmaker uses uh, Cyberpunk 2177 is a kind of background where, and then the narration from these two films, he's cut and split and put together as a commentary on the machinima movements of the character, usually done like riding or walking a POV from that character. And uh, it creates a very interesting contrast of things between these, uh, of feelings and ideas between these two things. It's a non-realistic film in a sense that it's a film about ideas and about uh, characters. Irony, which is something that I spoke last about last week. Irony meaning you present something knowing that it's going to be interpreted in the opposite way, which creates a kind of oftentimes either humor or a poignant feeling uh, in the viewer. So the, the viewership for this thing is not, if you're looking for a story, you're not going to find that. It's a different kind of viewing experience, and it's something that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, how to view this kind of film. I chose it uh, simply because I found it on the internet. I had no idea what its background was, uh, anything. I just watched it and I thought, well, it reminded me quite a bit of the 1930s modernist films in which um, the ability to superimpose images on top of each other to create ir ironic contrast was being used at the time, which is a sort of 
odd, bright kind of feeling in all the modernism. And it appealed to me in that way. But there are also some things that are, are goofy with it and are strange with it, which I want to discuss with you. I enjoyed the film very much. I found some of the moments poignant, uh, some of the contrasts poignant. I thought the editing in the film was just spectacularly good. The guy obviously knew the source materials and the machinima that he had created. I think that was a quite a creative use of it. Sound effects uh, and whatever tiny scratches of music were in it were effectively well made. There was strong poetic imagery in it. It was an original. And as you three know, I always admire originality in films above many other things. Those people looking for a plot uh, or a story are going to be disappointed. I enjoyed it, and I'm eager to hear what the three of you have to say about it. You want me to start? <laughs> sure. Oh, please. Yeah. I want to hear what you have to say. Oh, well, okay. Let me start a bit with the creator then, because I like to know who the creators are. Um, this guy, Hughes, he's 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 an activist artist, I would say, influenced by personal experiences of waste contamination of the natural environment, and he aims to move what he says is beyond the visual tropes of eco or plastic awareness, often exploring this kind of complex relationships between plastic nature, the natural and the virtual, where he kind of interweaves archival material, new, um, you know, in-game machinima, if you like, with film footage from sort of early exploration type videos, as you as you kind of said, um, in what he calls as a, as a kind of a new materialism. That's how he's describing it. His projects, um, it, it, most of them, he, they kind of touch on concepts like uh, viscosity, object agency, uh, circulation, hyper objects, the abyssal, ab abyssal, okay. like that, deep sea, and ongoing kind of ecological concerns to do with, um, well, just the natural environment, really. Through the work, he's trying to um, I think, challenge conventional ideas surrounding climate change and the broader environmental crisis. And interestingly, um, he says the first ocean life forms, because they were microscopic, um, he argues, therefore, that it is uh, what we cannot see that should be focused on now. That's, I think, the context. Now, he's got associations with organisations um, such as Plastic Pollution Coalition, which is based in LA, Surfers Against Sewage, uh, Plastic Free Jiju, uh, Plymouth Marine Lab, Blue Mind, the European Centre for Human Health, Sustainable Earth Institute, Raw Foundation, and numerous others, where you know collectively what they're doing is working on the impacts of plastics and waste. So he's deeply embedded in that kind of... Um, movement if you like. I think therefore it's perhaps not surprising that he's adopted video games as kind of found media which um, you know some argue are a pollutant and others a kind of perfect illustration of a of a of a broken world in their aesthetic representation and that's the kind of thing that we were talking about with Phil's pick a couple of weeks ago which I think was particularly um, relevant in this one. Um, I actually found some really interesting comments made by Matteo Bitanti on gamescene.org about um, Hughes' use, particularly not of cyberpunk, but of GTA V, which reflects on the many controversies around things like gang violence, car theft, and racial, stereoty racial um, stereotypes. Now, he's um, he appropriates video, the, the video game context because it's possible um, for him to go beyond the world to describe new imaginaries um, that allow for this kind of creativity beyond simply photographic. This photographic is one, one of the media forms that he uses as well. Um, to representing something um, a, a new and different, if you like. And, and it's in this way that some of his work has been... Um, described as analogous to the work of another director called Adam Curtis, um, who worked on films like uh, Hypernormalization and Can't Get You Out of My Head, particularly in the technique side uh, of how it's presented. Now, 
I would describe this kind of film, this particular one that we're looking at this week, as a Futurama of idealised life. And it's juxtaposing this imaginary corporate vision of a of a major company, and that company is General Motors, with another corporate's hyper-technologized environment, and that is CD Project Red Cyberpunk 2077. And at one point during the video, I latched on to the, the GM commentator saying something like, um, this is the new horizon in the spirit of indi individual enterprise in the great American way. And shortly after that, what you saw on the screen was the word flatlined, uh, in relation to the character being portrayed in the game because of the way that these things are being juxtaposed. And I think that gives you a sense of where this is positioned um, as commentary on the oil industry in particular, um, which you see represented in many different ways on the screen in the film. Everything from gasoline stations in the game to the motor industry of the 1940s to litter and mountains of waste connected using this kind of what I would describe as a palimpsest of time, where the older imaginary window is seen through the virtual newer views underneath it. So you kind of, you know, superimposed um, together, but basically presenting this window through time. I think it's making a point, um, but I actually think it's quite crude and, that, and that's not really a, a pun. Um, in fact, the more I watched of it, the more I kind of expected Just Stop Oil to kind of pop out from behind a, a car and spray <laughs> paint onto, you know, onto something in the in the game world somewhere because it was just so literal. Um, and at a literal level, I think, you know, what you're looking at here is an observation on the polluting impact of the oil industries on our world and the consequences of manipulating consumption, which Hughes argues uh, is in this is being achieved through a focus on efficiency, convenience, speed, and productivity, and to present a world that uh, can be uh, whatever we propose to make it. It's also at another level, Hughes, I think, attempting to comment on where he thinks the world may be going, a la cyberpunk or Blade Runner, perhaps. And I guess that may be a fair point um, for some cities or parts of the world. But these days, I kind of expect a little more from a film than this kind of literal commentary, especially um, from people that, that use machinima. We, we've seen much richer attempts at doing this kind of thing from machinima cre uh, creators. Um, also, I think, uh, you know, Matt Matteo comments, um, also, I think, on the literal nature of it. He, sa he said it's basically a film that... Ref um, reflects the disparity between historical opt optimism and kind of current uh, the current global situation. Not sure I actually fully agree with that though. Um, and that's because when I was looking at this, I was thinking about the work that we reviewed some months back now, um, probably about this time last year in actual fact, which had been filmed in Unreal. Uh, and I don't know if you guys would call it, it was, a, it was about a greenhouse where the privileged um, few, if you like, the wealthy, Oh yeah, um, yeah have access yeah, to yeah set in like air. a really dark future right that's right that's right so so they have access to unpolluted air and natural food and everyone else is reduced to growing tomatoes illicitly in derelict and condemned buildings because that's the ultimate impact of pollution and what you saw in that film was the politics of power um uh you know over remaining resources playing out to, as, a, as a destabilizing influence to to kind of create this dystopian world where i think what you've got here is a much more, um, you know, not questioning what you actually see in the video game, but kind of accepting what it is and not kind of interpreting it beyond that kind of, um, you know, literal representation, if you like. So for me, this film, I, I you know, whilst I really enjoyed it and I um, particularly enjoyed the, you know, looking into what this guy was doing and how he was doing it, I thought it actually lacked vision in its execution in, in the context of some of the other work that we've seen. And I, and I have to say, on that point, much like a lot of other GTA artist-made films we, we now see, I feel actually very few of them challenge what they see on the screen in a truly creative way. Um, I think that French one that we reviewed a few weeks ago was probably an exception to that, where it was questioning what it is to be virtual and real. I thought that was a much more creative interpretation. Um, uh, given that what we're talking about here is is for them found media, 
I mean, it's interesting, actually, that uh, there is a very small selection pool of games being chosen to make these kinds of work. And I, I'm not really sure, sure why that's the case, given there are so many so many games out there. I just don't understand why they just settle on just um, such a, a small pool like GTA, like Cyberpunk. I guess Cyberpunk was always going to be one of those that they would use in that way. Um, I guess also it's quite interesting to think how many people are attempting to to do this as activist artists um, using these these games in this way. So, you know, given this this particular film was a selection for the Milan Machinima Festival this this year, um, I yeah okay I can kind of see why they would do that because their focus is particularly on avant garde genre of of artists game based practice. But I I kind of wish they pushed the envelope a little bit more. Um, than they they seem to be. Now there is one more thing I would like to say about this. Oh, a couple more things actually. Um, I was intrigued, given that this is a Machinima Film Festival pick. I I had a look at Matteo's comments about it. Um, Matteo suggests that it's drawing on the work um, or drawing on the philosophy of somebody called Michel Serres um, to illustrate what what he described as soft pollution which he says is the impact of the portrayal of corrupting images and sounds on our psyches. Now, Serres was a humanist. His philosophy focused on big picture narratives, really of, of human culture and, and historical change, particularly focusing on the positive impact of science. He was actually a techno determinist, believing that the interconnectivity between technologies and the internet would lead to a new chapter in human history, equivalent, if you like, to the invention of the the printing press. So Matteo's comments actually refer to a particularly influential book that Serres wrote called uh, Malfeasance Appropriation Through Pollution, where basically he's arguing that in our search to be clean, we have in fact contaminated the earth, arguing that instead of solving issues related to our human well-being, we have multiplied pollution's effects catastrophically since the Industrial Lev uh, Revolution through the economic systems mode of appropriation and its emphasis on mindless growth. But I'm not too sure how cyberpunk pollutes our psyches any more than any other media form, or maybe the point is that it is yet another layer of soft pollution, uh, which with the weight of history upon it may ultimately uh, come to a breaking point. If I'd had more time, I would have probably tried to find out what Sarah's thought about computer video games specifically, because he only died uh, 2019, I think. Um, but I did find something that made me think Sarah's would probably have been less concerned about their polluting impacts and more interested in the ways in which they may provide the means for a new generation of people to learn. And that has very little to do with the realism of a specific game, but the way that games engage young people generally, very much, um, uh, in, in you know in reflect in on reflection of the comments that we were making uh, last week on Phil's pick, you know the way that um, people were sort of playing and learning new things from from games such as you know social responsibility and re and respect or testing ideas and what have you, you know games perhaps give people a new way um, to to come to uh, uh, you know socially acceptable ideas if you like so they. They learn how to be part of the human race, if you like. Um, I think the only real problem with this is that they, they haven't really solved, uh, particularly artists, activist artists, haven't really solved the distribution challenge that comes with being a machinima creator influencer. Um, you know, the, these these um, these films, particularly this type of film, has very limited um, reach compared to something like the, the film that we spoke about a couple of weeks back, Phil's film. Right. Right. Um, Matteo also makes reference to the first person perspective, and that's something you, you commented on, Ricky, when you were introducing it. This perspective of the camera as documentarian or commentator. And I get that, but actually I saw the camera as doing something a little bit different, um, which is that it is used to portray the passage of time um, rather than as a, an imaginary of a lived experience. Um, and why I think that's the case is because the final thing that I wanted to mention, and you'll probably have much more to say about this, is that I found the sound mixing odd. Um, 
but I suspect quite deliberate in the way that it was done. Now I'm, you know, as you know, I've got a binaural headset on here um, and that allows me to hear how sound has been designed um, and can be controlled. And what I was hearing in my headset is that in one ear, the sound of the of the piped narrative from the older videos were, was being, you know, pushed into that one. And in the other one, the game space was being pushed in. So I got two different things going on in my head, very separate. Um, and then as the work progresses, there are shifts in where you hear things in the headset. Now, generally, uh, the older stuff remains in the left ear and the newer stuff in the right. But the more the more towards the end you get, the more mixed it gets. And I'm guessing that that is a deliberate strategy. I think probably as a, I would say it's a clever device being used here. And I would imagine that what they're trying to do is portray the sense of, of, of time passing somehow left versus right and together being the sense of now. And I listened to it a couple of times because I wasn't sure if I'd made that up, but I haven't. And I have got the headset on the right way before you ask me <laughs> that one, Phil. Um, so I was quite impressed with that. And and that's what kind of what made me think about the context of what I was seeing more as the passage of time rather than kind of a literal um, first person perspective sort of thing. So it led me down a lot of interesting paths, Ricky. And I, and I think I, I really enjoyed it from that point of view if I didn't quite enjoy the film as much as some of the others that I've seen that are what I would call activist art. So that's my thoughts on it. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Well, um, I did. I watched it. I didn't make the oil connection. So if that is the purpose of this film, it, it kind of fails as far as I'm concerned. Um, I did get the first sense there was a real message with it. And of course, you've got the the videos from the, the 40s and the 1940s and 1960s of portraying this bright and hopeful future and how we're designing it or how they were designing the cities so that there would be nice places to live and uh, they're talking about the, the raised walkways so that you wouldn't have to worry about traffic and there's more space for traffic because people aren't walking there and all of that kind of stuff and you know it's kind of like the Jetsons type future where everything all the problems have been solved and you could just live a nice and happy life uh, and, and all of that and then you got the opposite of that with the Cyberpunk 2077 game which I did play quite extensively and there's absolutely nothing bright and hopeful about that future um and in the game yeah there, there are elements where you find out what's happened to earth since between where we are now and when the game is set and there are some people who care about it but there's nothing can be done to fix it and they know that it's a very bleak world of people just trying to survive um way back we did uh we covered a video that was a look at i can't remember the name of it but it was a look at cyberpunk and the world and it wasn't focusing on the story it's just glimpses of people around the city and how mm. hopeless they all seemed and if you go back and watch that that kind of gives you a sense of that world um and earth's been devastated um and there's lots of you know artificial and implants and things for people that pretty much no one has their own original body intact that you're going to find everyone there has got at least some kind of robotic and like a robotic leg or an arm or the implants on their face and some people take it to huge extremes where there's very little of their original bodies left and you know it's just there's nothing nice about that world it's fun to have as a video game setting but it's not somewhere you'd ever want to live or even visit um so the message I got from this video was this is the future that we were promised where everything is fine and this is the direction that the world seems to be going. Now I didn't pick up on Good the point. audience, it's just, just a general feel of that. And I did notice the, the sound kind of overlapping. It's kind of like we're kind of here where it could go either way. It kind of depends on what people do next. Ooh. Um because it's not saying we're definitely going on the cyberpunk route, but it's also saying we're not going on that hopeful promised future that sounded so good in those um, old videos. But, you know, there's still a chance that we could possibly make that happen. Uh, so that's the, what I came away from it. And it's nice to see cyberpunk being used. And it, for this kind of video, it makes perfect sense that if you want to show a bleak future, you have to choose a game 
that is set in a bleak future because all the content is right there and uh, and of course it's a huge city to explore you're going to find lots of places that are very run down and a lot of the environments and shots did match up quite nicely with the, the dialogue from the sort of videos they were talking like i mentioned just now the the raised walkways now they talk in the video in the uh, audio they talk about how this is going great because it keeps people safe from the traffic and all of that and then in the they show them in the game and of course just reckless wild driving right and on on the freeway but the way it's done also the the player behind the, the you know the player in this video there's a he was walking through the road he was not walking on the safe walkway he was walking through the, the, on the road and he wasn't driving right. he was actually right. walking and getting hit by cars or near misses yeah. Um, and if that happens in the game, the drivers shout things at you. They get out of the road and, or they don't care. They, they'll just drive straight into you because the society in this game, they don't care if they drive into you because they'll just hit you and then carry on going because that's, that's the theme of the game. And um, yeah, I was impressed by the, the use of the game and the way they lined up with that. Um, so as far as the oil goes, if they wanted to make that message, maybe they should make it a little bit clearer because I didn't. I got a similar message, but it wasn't down to oil and fossil fuels specifically. It was mm. just a general. Uh, this is not the way we want to go. We want to go the other way. Mm. So yeah, that's what that's what I came away from it. Good points. Very very similar impact on me, Damien. Mm. Um, I totally missed your I think brilliant observation about possibly what the audio was intended to symbolize that dichotomy never occurred to me that that's what they were doing i was i guess i'm probably listening to it from an engineer's perspective and thinking oh that's an interesting way to you know when when the when the gm films audio was off center sometimes you do that in a mix just because it stands out a little better and will come through and he could have it at a very low volume but you still perceive it if you put everything in the center Sometimes it gets muddled. So I assumed it was for that reason, but I love the idea that that, that was intended to be uh, symbolic. That's that's pretty genius if that's what was what was intended. Um, right. I found this film very moving. Um, and I'm not <clears throat> I'm not an activist. I'm not particularly sympathetic to activists. I feel like that a lot of them are just non-corporate propagandists of their own. Um, and they they put their agenda out there and and are out to manipulate people. That's a very broad and oversimplification. I get it, but that's I'm just explaining. That's my general attitude. And I think if I had known what the filmmaker was was into and such before watching this, I would have watched it very differently. But instead, I didn't know anything and didn't seek to know anything before watching. I just watched it, and um, so the. I don't know. There's kind of a, and I don't mean the word, this word in an insulting way. I mean it in the kind of elevated way that we've talked about over the years, Ricky, uh, the, the amateur nature of the production um, and the, the kind of it, little rough around the edges bits of it to me was uh, it gave it an every man sense. Um, it, it, it was a pot it, to me. It, it ended up in a positive column even though I love good production values and I love when people tie up every loose end and, and try to get every single detail. This had more of almost a scrappiness to it, but I, for the way that it impacted me, it worked uh, like really well. Um, I did see an awful lot of shots lingering on gasoline signs to where I wondered, is someone trying to say something here specific? But like, like Damien, it never really came blasting through Although having learned some of the history and background and stuff from trading, now it's like obvious. Okay, yeah, they were trying to do that. But as someone who just came to the film cold, it didn't overwhelm for me. Um, it was there, but I felt like that that wasn't out of place given the overall uh, theme of the film which was all about that contrast that Ricky highlighted right at the beginning. I would, I would even call it high contrast. Um, these are two starkly different views of the world juxtaposed 
right on top of each other. Um, starkly different. Weirdly enough, this film made me think a lot about uh, the Paul Thomas Anderson film, There Will Be Blood, which was, um, oh, who was the actor in that? Somebody help me, uh, please. Yeah, that wonderful actor. The, 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 yeah, uh, one of the Day Lu Daniel Day-Lewis. Daniel Day-Lewis, thank you. So in that movie, Daniel Day-Lewis is this oil baron back in the late 1800s, up into the early 1900s, I think. And he comes to this town and makes all these promises to the people about, we're going to build schools, my workers are all family men, so there'll be children, and we're going to build the church, and, and all this infrastructure that was promised. And then he gets there, none of that materializes. He never intended to deliver that. It was just the sales pitch. He's about getting that black stuff out of the ground and and turning it into wealth. And that's it. <clears throat> so there's in the modern psyche today, the zeitgeist right now, I think, is to tends to be one of cynicism towards authorities and corporations in particular and any well promises put. that they would make. Well put. You know? So even though one could argue that when GM made these films, and if you've ever visited, uh, if you ever visited Disney World in the in the eighties, well, tomorrow, Tomorrowland, yeah, you there's there's this ride on there, a ride called the People Mover, and it's just this slow indoor train that takes you through. Essentially, that GM audio could be the audio of that trip. It's it's all this very, uh, you know, flowery and very positive vibed description of how the future is going to be and technology and stuff. And I remember seeing that as a kid and it was just, it was fascinating, you know, and this, this GM film is made in exactly the same spirit, both these films, but the modern tendency today uh, mm -hmm. is we're, we're at a point where we question the veracity of those. We, we, we question whether they were being sincere. Mm -hmm. And that is the central question when evaluating those films nowadays, I think is, did they mean it or were they being like Daniel day Lewis's character and there will be blood. It was just an empty promise to, and it's all ultimately just all about getting our money. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone knows the answer to that, but people believe one or the other and tend to believe that very strongly. So, and I feel like that this filmmaker understands that and understands that 2024 years hearing those statements in GM about this beautiful future. Nobody just takes that, just swallows that and goes, oh, okay, anymore. You know, there's there's questions, especially given that when those were said, and then we look at where we are now, and then through the, the lens of this game, it's mm -hmm. a potential future. Um, it, it's very easy to just go, what's going on here? Were we, were they just dumb? and wrong or did they lie to us you know and yeah i think that that regardless of where you fall in that question this film brilliantly strums those emotions um and creates a for me maybe for everybody to some degree no matter when you grew up when you were a kid you were more optimistic about these things you 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 you, you had a, it was easier to believe in a utopian future of that kind. And as you get older, it's not so easy to believe because you've seen more and you, you realize that doesn't seem to be where we're trending. Mm. Not on all fronts, you know? Um, there are things that are certain, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not a, I am not a pessimist or a nihilist. I have no doubt that we are living in the easiest time to live in probably all of human history, you know, we've got it good. We've got it real good. But is this world perfect or not broken? Absolutely not. You know, there's problems and, and there's potential dangers, looming dangers in some cases. Right. Um, that even though I can, those things can be true at the same time, I can recognize that, man, compared to how people what had people had to go through 200 years ago, even a hundred years ago. And we got a pretty darn good, you know, that's pretty good. 
sitting here in air conditioning. Electricity is, you don't even think about anymore. Talking you know? to each other, all the four of us talking to each other in different parts we're, of the world. Yeah, <laughs> we're in, on different continents and we're having a live conversation. I mean, just there's a lot to be positive about, but there's also a sense that mm, don't get lulled too much by that. Yep. Because not all is great, you know? Yep. And certainly not all is great for everyone, mm -hmm. um, which I think is the central political question, really, is what to do about that. Yeah. I think both sides of the political aisle recognize that that's a problem and have radically different, in, in some cases, radically different ideas of how to solve it. But we all know the problem's there and that this thing is a, this is a machine that needs a lot of maintenance and in some cases, probably a lot of repair, this, this thing we call society. There's even, you know, in different parts of the world, there's people who have a completely different idea of what the machine should even look like, you know, and would just soon tear ours down. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, that the yeah. West is evil, et cetera, et cetera. You know, these are all things that are going on right now. And uh, I, I feel like that, that this film really, really captured it well. I mean, I don't have a lot of criticism for this film because, again, the scrappiness of it, uh, I think, contributed positively to my experience of the film um there are some issues with the sound mix i felt like at some points so there's this there's this recurring theme in the audio of uh footfalls rather heavy footfalls it reminded me a little bit of uh there's a there's a running sound that they use in that pink floyd used i believe in dark side of the moon and maybe a little even a little bit in the wall and it creates this real it really elevates tension in a very effective way. And so it it kind of struck me in that vibe, the, the footsteps and the fact that they didn't seem to completely line up volume wise with what the movement was on the screen. For, again, it just didn't, I noticed it, but it didn't, it wasn't upsetting to me or, or jarring. And this film really wasn't about immersion. So it didn't like take me out of it. Right. It wasn't a story. Uh, this this was a <clears throat> a poem of sorts, a wordless poem, because the, the the words of the narration aren't the poem. The poem is the juxtaposition. So I don't know if it's a poem or a painting or what, but it's it's not a story. It's not intended to be. Um, it's a view. Uh, yeah, I really liked it. I, I I, and again, I'm not a negative. I don't. I'm an optimistic person, not unhealthily so, I don't think. But, you know, when I was younger, I I dabbled with the nihilism quite a bit, you know. It's it's seductive. Uh, but I'm not there right now, but still I got this film and it and it, and it kind of moved me and it probably would have done so less if I'd known that it was created with specific and maybe even propagandistic intent. I don't think I would have let myself, I, I'm too stubborn. I would have gone, nah, I'm not taking that. But I didn't, fortunately, I think. I yeah, just yeah. took it for what it was and uh, and it did, it, 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 it moved me. It didn't move me to action necessarily because as I think Damien highlighted, nobody really knows what to do about, about some of these problems. Nobody has any, any idea what to do, you know? Um, but it did... I felt something. Um, I felt a discomfort, but I ended up grateful for it. Is that weird to say? Like uh, I, I felt like I, you know, I got not it. that I not that I needed it, but that that I didn't mind. Like like I felt like maybe I did need to feel uncomfortable about this. I need to to always remember uh, that we're not on track with what was speculated and it's either because those ideals were never realistic in the first place or because we've been misled and to me the central if there was a central theme of this that came through to me without the background it wasn't oil companies specifically it wasn't pollution specifically it was more of to me, cyberpunk, the world of cyberpunk 2077 seems reminiscent of a world that has been completely consumed by consumerism. 
by consumption itself, mm -hmm. you know, that it's all about, I want what I want and I want it right now. Mm -hmm. And that's, and in all the levels of that, that that can play out, I feel like the cyberpunk world, both in the game and if the, in the animated TV series, you've seen that where it's even more stark. Um, all these bio modifications and all the drugs that people are using and machines to, to get sensual pleasure from it's really graphic in the, in the cartoon. My goodness. Uh, watched it with my son and was quite embarrassed at points. Like, it's like, <laughs> holy crap. But those are all just manifestation manifestations of this kind of hyper hedonism you know, just seeking of pleasure. And that's the, that's the only morality. That's the only thing. And that's the result is a, a society that is more than fragmented. It's busted, you know, and we are frightfully not, you know, it, it would take frightfully little for us to become that, you know, I mean, look at what self gratification, how high a virtue that is in our world today uh, it's we're not that far. It may look like it from looking at the tech in that game and whatnot, but the philosophy that got the world of cyberpunk 2077 where it is, is, is trumpeted and heralded by some today. So it's very right, I think, to have at least some concern. So yeah, all of that came through to me with the film. I, I It's one of the favorite picks that I've seen this whole year, Ricky. It, it's, you always manage to, uh, to, to grab ones that just hmm. get me right here and this this I'm did. so glad and frankly by comparison my my cops on as, as I said before we started recording my cops on the rooftop film I'm kind of embarrassed at the, <laughs> at the pick. <laughs> and I don't say don't that with be. insecurity I mean simply that this is so good don't uh, be that this is this is uh every question we had about that GTA film that I had picked of was there an intentional message or not we can debate about how specific the message was, but this definitely had an intentional message and it was effective. You know, it, it's unpleasant maybe. And if it's intended as propaganda, then I guess part of me is kind of offended at the idea of that, right? <laughs> but the film on its merits, yeah, it, it, it did the job, I think, Maybe it was supposed to do, unless, like Damien said, if it was, if it really was to get me to hate, you know, BP and Shell Oil, it, 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 it fail, epic fail. I, it, I, I'm still going to go gas up my car when we're done here today, you know. But, uh, but in terms of the general message about uh, that contrast, that central contrast of the film, yeah, in, in many ways, uh, brilliant. I'm so glad. So, thanks for the pick, Ricky. Yeah. Well, fascinating. Again, fascinating takes on this uh, interesting film. I have a short comment, and then I'd like to close with a question to the three of you to see what you think of it. I believe uh, over all of the years that I've been watching all kinds of entertainment and art, thinking about it, that when artists, when somebody creates something, the creation develops an existence on its own, and that Sometimes the artists put things in the uh, uh, their creation that they didn't intend or they happen subconsciously. In many ways, I think that's the case with this film. Because even though Tracy's excellent digging into what this filmmaker ideas were and what he was trying to do with the film, I think there was more put in the film than that person thought when they made the film. They're in, they intended to make the film. As you all point out, if it's a if it's to take action, it did not succeed in doing that. I think there's the person unconsciously or con or by accident put poetry into this. And I think that's what interests me in in the poetry. In a way, I would call this film a fiction of ideas. That's great. Hmm. Because it's like a fiction film, but it's about ideas. So my question to you all is, 
how does a just a general viewer, somebody who's watching, just comes to a film to watch it with no information about it, no background history of the author, no nothing, just watching the film for what it is. How do you view a film like this? Huh. It's obviously, obviously not a realistic film, but it has realistic elements. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do. It's not necessarily, it's not a documentary, and yet it has documentary elements into it. So what are your takes on how, how does a viewer make sense of a film like this? I, my my perspective on that is it is entirely uh, dependent on on where they see this film and what their familiarity and experience is with the kind of material that's in it. Now we've talked about this in the context of the, of the games that we understand. We've talked about these games a lot. We've never seen these um, Futurama type um, videos before, but we kind of know what 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 they're all about. Um, so we've put a kind of a level of intelligence on it that perhaps uh, an un um, inexperienced perhaps audience might. Um, but I, I can tell you something. If you saw this film in a gallery where there is an exhibition about, say, the polluting impacts of the oil industry, you're going to look at this video in a very different way to one where you just find it on the Internet, mixed in, say, with a lot of... Um, boss kill type videos or frag <laughs> videos and all that kind of stuff you're just going to look at it in a you know just depends the context in which you see it and how familiar you are with the kind of work that you're looking at i think so you'll see it in different ways that's I what i meant it. that's really what i meant about distribution being the main challenge that these guys face if if there is a message in this if there is a um, something deeper that they would like to portray. The, the challenge they've got is cutting through the context in which others might view it. And uh, that's not easy to do if it's going to be distributed through, say through um, the, the, you know, the various kind of common platforms that everybody accesses this kind of material through. If it's a gallery based thing only that you see, which a lot of the, the films are that um, the machinima film festival showcases you don't tend to find them necessarily online easily but you you'll you know you'll go to a festival or what have you and they're viewed in that kind of context you're you're appealing to a very different audience with it um and i think that's 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 the challenge that's the challenge the artists face that's the challenge the um uh you know the the, the viewer faces in trying to make sense of these kinds of things yeah I think uh, I'm going to answer that your question, Ricky, in a little with a little bit different tack because I think that the the viewer very often, probably almost always, has no control over the context in which they'll mm. they'll see the film. Mm. That's happenstance often, you know. Uh, the artist has can have some controls over that. They don't have full control. It's the internet, you know. So, but uh, so I'm focusing more on as the viewer and i think you know probably the most important trait or quality to approach this or any film is just one of openness if that's not too simple but i mean i think mm, yeah. um uh, and that's that's that sounds easy but it's not you know because right. you all exactly every, everyone who comes to a work that's been created be it text a book or be it uh, a film they're bringing or even music they're bringing they're bringing a lot of baggage with them when they show up you know like and i mean by baggage i mean a lot of experience that is going to shape how they perceive it but you can't control that either you know that's just your life has done that and so you can't control that and you can't control necessarily where you're going to see it um but you can control your the attitude with which you approach it i think and it, it and, and I think openness is probably the most important trait there of, uh, which is a learned thing, I think. I don't, I think very few people uh, have openness to new things natively. It's something that one, I think, chooses to prioritize and work on. And I, I've not, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. I am that way, let's put it this way. I am that way more now than I, than I was. <laughs> I'm not the most open person I'm in the glad. world by 
far, mm. but I, I feel like I've, I've made progress in that direction and it's helped me, you know, in the same way when I met my wife, I had a pretty, after living single for 15 years, I had a pretty limited, uh, diet limited palette for food, like what I like was a smaller set than it is now, which she's got, you know, she's, she's from totally different ethnic influences and has introduced me to all these different foods. And then I've got kids and I want them to eat the vegetables. So I better too. And so all of that has expanded my openness to what's on my plate and even let me eliminate some things that should have never been there in the first place. You know, I think consuming film, if that's not a horrible word to use, but I think that there's something similar there that that you you can develop an openness to try new things or to experience new things, and that that will benefit you. You you're still going to come across stuff that you just strongly dislike. It's still gonna. But the cool thing is, is you just turn it off. You just switch to something else. You know, there, you're not strapped to a chair like the guy in Clockwork Orange or anything with your eyelids propped open. You just stop watching if you don't like it. But just because you tried a weird food once and you didn't like it doesn't mean you shouldn't try other new foods. Yeah. And I think the Good same point. is true. I think the same is true for, I, I had never tried Vietnamese noodle soup until Ricky and I had it. He introduced me to it when we went to New York for the Machinima Film Festival. And we went down to Chinatown and he took us to this place and it was Vietnamese. And they were herbs and flavors in there that I had never experienced before. I'd just never been exposed to it. That is great. Now I seek that out. So I think films are the same way as food in that regard. Cool. Damien? Uh, so this is one of those films that obviously that is that message about um, fossil fuels that uh, kind of went over our heads a little bit. But it's designed to make you think. Um, I, one of the other things that came to mind was... Or feel. I mentioned it. Yeah, or feel. It was... An episode of well, it's two episodes of Star Trek, uh, Deep Space Nine, released in '95, called Past Tense, and the idea was, um, some of the main characters get sent back in time to, uh, 2024. Coincidentally, it, this story's been on my mind quite a bit. I remember watching that originally when it first aired, and it kind of shows society's kind of breaking down. There's lots of homeless people, and, um. The story focuses on something called the Bell Riots, which is meant to be the most violent civil disturbance in American history, according to Star Trek. And I remember watching that in 1905 and thinking, well, it's an interesting story, but that could never happen. It's That's just silly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, watching it again more recently, I now thinking, well, that's hard to imagine that not happening. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there, there's conversations in in the episode talking about other problems around the world that very strangely echo the real world and so i actually feel like after this conversation i want to go and research the episodes a bit more to see what the writers were thinking about when they wrote it because i as an elder I, I, and with more world experiences like phil you talked about um a few times i understood this episode a lot better than i did when it first came on and it gives you a lot of th to think about. Of I imagine the writers are thinking, this is something we should probably avoid happening. And so that's why I want to do that research and have a look, see what they have to say. Um, and obviously, we haven't done a good job of avoiding that because it feels very close. Um, and those episodes were designed to make the audience think. Now, I think when I first watched it, I was a little bit too young to fully appreciate that. I still enjoyed the story, but that particular message, I didn't get it. Um, but now I do. And I think this film that we've been talking about is one of those things where you watch it, it gives you something to think about. Now, maybe someone watching it will get, actually, I know how to fix that. Whether or not they have the ability to fix it, that's another matter. Um, and, you know, the, the people who maybe do have the power to fix it, they might, if they were to watch this, it may go over their head completely in a different way because they'll look at the side of things and think, this is just some stupid video game. Who cares about that? Um, without thinking, well, maybe this is something we should not necessarily be striving towards. Uh, so I think, it, yeah, it depends on the mindset of who's watching it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd like to think maybe more people watch it will start thinking, well, what can we do about this? 
Yeah. Uh, Cause I watched it. I asked, my, I asked myself that question. I have no answers, um, but it was something I'd like an answer to. I'm glad you Good brought point. up Star Trek, uh, Damien, because I think Roddenberry, Gene Roddenberry is a great example of, uh, of an activist hmm. in a way, you know? I mean, yeah. he used that show uh, and for the large part, the show continued that tradition even after he was gone, but he used that show to directly address social ills that he thought there were solutions for, achievable solutions. And so he was, yep. he would take chances with regard to, you know, issues that he thought were just silly that we were being silly about, like race, you know, that, that and, and he solved that, solved it by portraying a world where that, that wasn't the issue anymore. Yeah. And look, it, it works. And yeah. I think that that's the formula to, to most of Star Trek, like that's that's really what his intent was. It wasn't about Captain Kirk or Spock or any aliens or anything like that, really. It was an environment in which to address issues that we could fix. Yeah. And that may be the biggest contrast to this type of film, which is, like you said, designed to make you think and feel, but it doesn't have any solution yeah. in mind at all. It's really just focusing on the problem. And the I problem. think it's mainly because nobody quite knows what to do here, really. Not really. Yeah. Uh, so, but I think it's important to note that that doesn't mean that you shouldn't talk about that problem or make films about th those problems. They need attention too. Even yes. if like Roddenberry, you don't have the solution there yes. to kind of sprinkle into the, into the writing of the episode or something. Well put. You, you, illustrating you know humans encountering a different race and that planet has these problems that look a lot like some of the problems we have and then they help them solve it because they're you know they've moved past it those are great um because you it, it's it's a project you, you you can see yourself finishing you know as a society yeah. but there are bigger problems that don't have quick solutions but like Indeed. you said maybe somebody gets the idea we just have to keep it in their mind the, the worst thing in the world that could happen to us is that we forget about yeah. an issue like this and i'm We're talking about being... the issue as it struck me not not the anti-oil company thing to me that's too specific and yeah. it's an oversimplification of a much larger problem to just yeah. say no oh, it's just oil companies no it's not it's bigger than that so <clears throat> yeah no it's, it's I'm glad you brought up star trek because it's it's a it's a nice contrast to yeah. other types of using what was the word the the phrase that you came up with ricky fiction a fiction of ideas yeah fiction of ideas uh, sci-fi has has long been the king of that. indeed it's one of the um, reasons why i love science fiction because it feels safe to play with those potentially really aggravating really upsetting ideas but in sci-fi and fantasy even it feels safe to explore those in more detail than it would be to just sit down and address them directly. And not only safe, it's much more effective messaging. Like it's it's digestible and palatable. Indeed, yeah. 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 Well, the reason why I asked the question of you three, and I appreciate your answers, um, as usual, they're right to the point, is that I watched the film cold, enjoyed it, took a lot of notes, and then started doing a little research on it and discovered it, it was a, a Milan Film Festival 2024 pick. And I thought, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. Yeah, not so surprising, I read the, right? Yeah, so I read the description that the uh, person who, who chose it, and they wrote this long three paragraph description of some film that they saw that I didn't see. Mm -hmm made absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. <laughs> I understood the words, I understood the concepts, but it didn't apply to the film that I saw. So it made me think, well, why why would they write that when there's so obvious so many obvious things in this film that appeal more directly to a viewer than going to an elevated notion of philo philosophical concepts of 
ec ecological disaster and ecology you know, because none of that to me you could see that in the film i mean yeah you could find little parts of it here and there but that wasn't what i got out of it at all and i thought well well then i guess different people view films of this nature polemical kinds of films in different ways and i wanted to hear what you guys had to say about it but ricky don't and you think also partly partly with this particular film i could not find a description that the artist had put out about the film at all ah. even, on, mm -hmm. even on his own website and it was entirely down to in this case i think this film um premiered at the Milan uh, film, film Festival. It was entirely down to Matteo to describe it. Why did the artist not do it? Why, why yes, did, why that's a very good question. Because that's a common thing, I think. They just, they just seemingly put the, the smallest possible description, you know, like a one line or even a title. I mean, what does inner migration 720 actually mean i could find no i couldn't understand well unless what he was talking about was the film format from 720 to you know bigger i don't know i couldn't get the well, sense I, of the I, title at all there was nothing to do i think it's the david lynch effect mm. they don't want to explain the film they want the film to exist on its own mm. and for people to get what they get out of it and i think that's exactly the, the right way to do it because if you start explaining it all and you say well i intended in this shot to do this you're going to say well i didn't see that yeah you could as you so well point out in your description of the film all of those things that you talked about are in the film now that you've said that i can see them but that's not what i got out of the film mm. for example at the end there was a very poignant moment at the end of the film where the uh, GM, oh no, no, the America, the American documentary about how great America is going to be in the future, where everybody's going to live in prosperity. And the film focuses on the sad, lonely motel, no vacancy sign. Mm -hmm. It's a great In moment. this beautiful lighting, mm -hmm. no vacancy. It's just the, the contrast between those things was so poignant to me. It made me sad. And I don't think, I, personally, I don't think that's what the artist was trying to do in that. Just but he did it anyway. Yeah, yeah, he did it anyway. And I think sometimes that's why I pointed out that artists' creations sometimes take on a life of their own. Mm. I and he, may be, he may be describing something that he doesn't even realize is in his film, you know? Um, anyway, come, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Couple, no, just you to go finish ahead. that off, a couple of months ago, I watched this interview with Christopher Nolan, and um, he was talking about uh, one of his, I think it was his first film, Memento, and he took it to a film fest, uh, test screening, that was it, test screening, and then he did a Q&A afterwards, and he said that, you know, he explained the ending, because someone asked him, what does that ending mean? And then afterwards, he said, he came out, and his brother came out to him, took him by the arm, and said, you should never do that again. <laughs> Um, because and, and Christopher Nolan said, "Yeah, but he wants to know what the what I thought of the ending." He said, it "Doesn't matter. You made an ending that's ambiguous, and you want the audience to come to it. But if you explain it to them, no matter what their interpretation is, as soon as you explain it, that initial interpretation is gone, and they'll just exactly. go with what you said." Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. So he, perfect. Yeah, and so every film he's made since, uh, he does not explain the endings if they're ambiguous. And yep. he makes a big point of that. Smart. Great. Yeah. That's one great. more quick note just to answer sure. the, to resolve a little ambiguity here. The 720 mm -hmm. on Vimeo, where we have this uh, film, the, the, the video is uploaded in 720p. So the 720 oh. is probably just a reference to that. He probably labels his film files like I do. If oh, I've got okay. a 1080 p one, I'll put that on it. If I have a 4k, I'll do that. So the 720, so really probably the, the, title of the film is actually just intermigration what that means no idea but yeah that's yeah. okay it's a poetic yeah. poetic thing right um yeah. oh well thank you again for your discussion i'd like to point out to machinima filmmakers or possible machinima filmmakers who are watching this 
that the ability to take uh, films from the Prelinger archive at archive.org, and we'll put a link in the show notes to this. They're all free. They're all uh, create. Uh, they're all copyright free. Um, you can use them. You can take a. You can do what this filmmaker did: is use a Machinima engine or game engine or Unreal, whatever you want, and then juxtapose in your own fashion. Uh, films from the Prolinger archive or, or or music or dialogue or all sorts of images you could do with this. It's a creative and interesting way to use machinima. Uh, all of that can be done. There's um, some real gems urge... in there too. Yes, indeed. Of, of all in types. Fact, yes. And uh, so I urge you to watch this film for inspiration. And then if you want to make your own uh, fiction of ideas, please do so. I think it's a very interesting way to make films, and and I think this film shows you how to do it. Well, thank you very much for your your comments. As usual, they're interesting and unusual, and I think it's a real contrast from our last week's pick. But the ideas were very interesting. It spurred a lot of ideas, and I'm really happy. I'm glad the show does that. It's one reason why I'm I'm on it and participate in it. So thank you, Tracy and Damien and Phil for your thoughts. Uh, make sure you check out our show notes if you have a comment uh, about the film or if you're the filmmaker and you want to explain the ending of the film to us, <laughs> despite Christopher Nolan's, uh, uh, Christopher <laughs> Nolan's brother will seek you out, but it's okay. Uh, contact us at, uh, in, at talk oh. at completely machinima.com and let us know what you think. So that's it. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned next week for more exciting action from and now from completelymachinima.com podcast. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.